The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprung, sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As For what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. On this seventh Sunday after Pentecost, 2023, the word comes to us from St. Matthew's Gospel, the 13th chapter. What are parables for? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The thing about parables is this. When we read them, we like to see ourselves in the parable. We like to see ourselves in these parables, and of course, uh, we like then to use these parables as calls for action in our own lives. Why? Because the default setting for us is always to do our own thing. To seek our own glory. To be our own Savior. One could say that's our original problem. So we hear our Lord Christ with this parable about the sower And then we try to figure out, we try to place ourselves into this parable and try to figure out, well, am I the guy who's um, the path, who hears the word but doesn't get it? Am I the rocky ground who hears the word and then when it gets rough, I, I, I fall away? Am I that guy? Am I the thorns guy who hears the word and then the cares of the world and money and things Um, uh, just crowd all of that out. Crowd God's word out. Which one of them am I? So after we get done putting ourselves in the parable, we tend to do what? Evaluate our own lives in light of it. Am I the path guy, the rocky guy, the thorn guy? Am I the good soil guy? We do this because we believe deep down in our hearts that all of us can somehow change the quality of our soil, so to speak, and in general, our situation before God. That somehow our salvation belongs in our own hands. That if we just do this, or do that, or make this tweak, or that adjustment, then we will be right with God. Stuff like that. We love the idea of turning parables into some sort of self-improvement project because we love the idea of self-improvement projects. Five more steps to do this or to get here or to be that. That's how we commonly receive parables and read them. Why does Jesus use parables? Well, the popular understanding, and, and I confess, this is how I've always seen it as well, is that Jesus taught parables so common people could understand what he was teaching. 
For example, he used agricultural parables to teach peasant farmers the truth so that they would understand it. But is that what Jesus is really doing with these parables? Is that what he's doing this morning? It turns out that the disciples actually asked Jesus, what's with the parables? Like, Why are you speaking this way, Jesus? Unfortunately, it's left out of our, our assigned gospel lesson this morning. It falls in between those two sections that we had this morning. So, St. Matthew records it this way. The disciples came, after Jesus told the parable of the sower, the disciples came and said to Jesus, why do you speak to them, the crowd that was on the beach there, why do you speak to them in parables? Now Jesus doesn't say that he teaches this way, he doesn't teach these parables to explain things to the common people so they get it. Because after all, his disciples are common guys. No, he says this, to you, to my disciples who are with me, who have been following with me, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, to the people on the beach, it has not been given. Jesus is speaking to his disciples when he says, to you. Now, to you is promise language. What promise is Jesus referring to? Well, just before our parable this morning and last week's gospel lesson, Jesus says to his disciples, perhaps one of the most well-known passages in the gospels, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's a promise. You will find rest for your souls. Well, how so? Why does Jesus say this to his disciples who have been following behind him? Well, where is he on the way to? In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus turns his face to Jerusalem and he is on the way now when he shares this good news with his disciples. He's on the way to the cross. To you, his disciples, he gives rest. To his disciples in the Gospels, he was on his way to the cross. To you who are on the other side of the cross, he gives rest. He gives rest to you because you who were in Christ Jesus, there is no more condemnation for you. You heard St. Paul write that to the church in Rome. Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. By having his saving work upon the cross, Christ has done, as the psalm says, blotted out all of your transgressions. Now souls can rest in that. He's taken the burden of your sins and death and in return has given to you His righteousness, His holiness. Now this was all coming when Jesus shared this good news with His disciples. This was all in front of Him. He was on His way. But nevertheless, He knew what the mission was. So to you, his disciples in the Gospels, to you, His disciples in 2023, to you, He has given the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. You have it. So to sum up, the secret is this. God has come to you in the flesh. And He is the God of our salvation, Jesus. What Jesus has done by His death and resurrection for us, He has left nothing for us to do on our salvation at all. It's been done. As He cried from the cross, it is finished. It is all sufficient, as it says in Hebrews. So Jesus says to you, His disciples, to you it's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, to those who don't have the Word, It has not been given. To those without the word in their ears, there is no making oneself into good soil. There is no changing the soil out on your own. There's no spiritual work that you can do to make yourself holy or righteous with God. 
Father Luther writes about this in the bondage of the will. He's talking about salvation when he says, free will is fiction. And to us, to us who are so enamored with, with taking care of everything our own, our own, that, that we can do this, we can just pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and make this happen, to us this is absolutely offensive. Surely there is something that I can do to make myself go from rocky ground to good soil. There has to be something. Why do we ask this question? Because what? We want the glory. We want it to be about us. We want the credit. We want the merit. We want the honor. What should we do then? That's always the next question. What shall we do? What shall we do if we're not the good soil? And the gospel answers this way. Nothing. Nothing. There's nothing you can do. Gerhard Ferdy, great Lutheran theologian, once said, just close your mouth. Stop talking. And do nothing. And then hear something like this. On account of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. And in His stead and by His command, He has sent me to throw seeds out to you. You are forgiven. Christ has claimed you in your baptism. You belong to Him. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead on Easter Sunday morning now dwells in you. And this was poured out upon you in baptism. This same Spirit now dwells in you and will give life to your mortal bodies on that last day. And you shall rise. Death has no claim over you anymore. Jesus does. Now this is the sure, certain, and perfect word of promise of Jesus Christ. You have this word of promise from the Son of the living God who has conquered sin and death for you. It's now in your ears. The seeds have been cast. It's upon your hearts. Salvation is yours in Christ Jesus. You belong to Him. And this is how soil is made good. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.